morning, friends, and welcome to our program today. I'm Dr. Willie Nutt with San Jose Word of Faith Christian Center. It's always a pleasure to have you join us uh, during our broadcast uh, each week. We're going to continue in a uh, sermon that uh, we began a few weeks ago entitled Obtaining Full Joy. Obtaining Full Joy. Praise the Lord. The charm of every preacher and believer is to exercise God's word so they can have their own personal testimony. I hope that is the case uh, in your life of God's faithfulness uh, to his word, which they can share with others who have not embraced Jesus as the Lord of their life. The Lord Jesus confirmed this expectation, identifying um, the works we should be uh, doing, saying the following in St. John, the 14th chapter, verse 12. I'm going to read from the New King James Version for clarity's sake. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, the Lord Jesus is speaking here. Uh, he who believes in me, uh, the works that I do, will he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. It is unfortunate, but many believers have been conditioned by the clergy to place the promise, this particular promise, for living uh, during the Christ's earthly sojourn and the uh, times of the twelve apostles, and have not uh, um, for we um, who call ourselves believers uh, been addressed as those that should receive this bounty. So, in other words, they had limited the ability to operate in the supernatural to what was done during the time of the 12 apostles, uh, what was done during the time of Christ, but they did not extend it into our particular time, and that's an error. Uh, the Lord made it clear in that verse there, for those who believe is what those promises are for. However, if you carefully read the verse, the Lord Jesus does not limit the promise uh, to the apostles or those living during their times. But the, prime, uh, the promise is generic, including all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the text describes uh, he to whom the promise uh, applies, saying the following, he that believes in me. This means that every believer who will dare operate in faith can receive the benefits of this particular promise. The Apostle Paul further declared that believers are ordained for these kinds of exploits, saying the following in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 10. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says the following, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's amazing when people talk about salvation and the basis of salvation, uh, preaching, they intentionally, I believe, leave this particular verse out, which comes on the heels of how one is able to be saved, how to confess Jesus as Lord and believe that he saves them. And this tells us what our charter is. It's just fascinating to me how that so cleverly pastors can make sure they leave that out. Uh, because they're denominational persuasion, because they want to keep their job as pastor, and a lot of people don't support what I'm just reading right here. Again, let me read it again, since that's the case. Ephesians, the second chapter, and the tenth verse. Praise God. For we are his workmanship, uh, we who are believers. He's talking to the Ephesian church, and by implication, he's talking to we who are listening today, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're created for good works. Uh, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So a lot of people say, a lot who are in the leadership will tell you, don't worry about the works, you know, we're not saved by works. It's true, I'm not saved by works, but by the fact that I'm saved, works will correspond to the fact and will substantiate the fact that I'm a child of God because I'm living by the works. I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm concerned about what the Lord sees. So I don't dare revert back to the kind of lifestyle I lived before. One, I admitted by com uh, confession of Jesus as Lord and by repenting that it was wrong. Why, why should I go back? In fact, uh, Peter makes a statement, and we're going to move on, but Peter makes a statement that the dog has re returned to wallowing uh, has returned to his slop and uh, actually to um, his regurgitation, his throw up, and the, the, the uh, swine or the pig has returned to wallowing in the mire. So people that threw up stuff, has left it behind. I know that's a terrible descriptive um, point that I'm making here, but I think you all get it. It's the same as, 
uh, what a dog does. He takes up his regurgitation and his throw up and eats it again. The dogs will do that. And uh, by implication, Peter says, some people are like that with their spiritual life. That old man, that old nature that they were supposed to have left in the past, they go back and look for that dirt up. They look for some throw up so they can swallow it up again and start living the same way. And pigs the same way. You can wash a pig, clean them up, put soap on them, uh, put perfume on them, put a ribbon around their neck. But as soon as you let that pig go, he's going to look for some slop to wallow in. They just like, they just love that, all that stuff all on them. All the stuff you clean them from, so you have to wash them again. The pig nature is a continually uh, wallow in slop. And that's where some people are. They get saved. They live for the Lord. Next thing you know, they're back in the slop that they were delivered from. So the, the point I'm making is that uh, Christ saves those people who hear the word. But then there should be a corresponding ex. Uh, effort that comes in our life that we live that will be free of those kinds of sins. Now if someone to slip and sin, the Apostle uh, John makes a statement in uh, 1 John, the second chapter. If, not when, if any man sin he has, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiator of our sins, but not for our sins only, for the sins of the whole world. And for those who want to play games with the word, and some are doing that today, it said all of our sins are covered. doesn't matter how we live. No, you got to continue reading in the second chapter. And you'll find that the scriptures are very clear that one who is saved will live the kind of life that is expected by Father God, that he will continue to walk in the light as Christ in the light. And so, not to, oh, I can go back and eat my slop, I can go back and do all the bad things I did, and still make it to heaven. No, no, uh, the work, you are his workmanship. Notice that. Again, um, back to Ephesians, the second chapter, and the tenth verse. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. That's the old King James. Before ordained, in advance, he stated, that's the kind of lifestyle you're supposed to live as believers. Then the Apostle Paul described the lofty position we have with the Lord, with God, describing uh, or declaring that we who are believers are considered to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus in the following, in the earth realm, and he confirms this in the following verse found in 2 Corinthians, uh, the 5th chapter, and the, 7th, and the 20th verse again. 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, 20th verse. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. Apostle Paul telling us what we are. Praise God, or, or who we are. We are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, uh, be reconciled. To God. We need to be reconciled to God in the kind of life that we're living. Praise God. A life that's befitting one who calls himself a child of God. One who's created to live the kind of lofty life that God expected from those who are believers. Uh, the word ambassador uh, that we read in that particular verse contained in the text from, is from uh, uh, a Greek word, presbio. Actually, we get our word presbyter from that. Uh, it means senior representative an ambassador, and a preacher. It means, again, not a, um, a neophyte in the things of God, but one who's developed, a senior representative, an ambassador, a preacher. According to this definition, if you have taken the initiative to possess your full rights as a believer, uh, a servant of the living God, then you are not a junior, one of inferior uh, qualities, one who is a subordinate uh, in rank, but rather you are a senior representative, a high-ranking representative. For the Lord Jesus Christ stated it. And so you're high-ranking, if you're an ambassador of Christ Jesus, you're a high-ranking representative of Christ. Praise the Lord. You have a lofty position that you need to live up to. If you are functioning in your rights as an ambassador, as a senior representative, Hit your chest and say, thank God I'm a senior representative. If not, uh, ask the Lord to forgive you and move in that direction. Praise the Lord. Uh, again, as a senior representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, then according to the scripture, uh, your job is to implore. You have a job to implore, to plead with those who are not disciples, nor adherents to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they should be reconciled to God. The word reconcile literally means to reunite, to patch up, and to bring back together. The implication is a terrible breach, a chasm uh, was placed between 
humankind and God because of the failure of the first man in the Garden of Eden. The only bridge, listen to me, the only remedy that God the Father has provided for man reuniting with him is his son. He's the only bridge. He's the only way. The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus out of his own mouth confirmed this saying in John 14 and 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's speaking to his apostles here, making it very clear. It's for us today. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he made it real clear to them. I am the only way to the Father. You know, when we pray, we, uh, we don't pray in Jesus' name. We pray in the name of the Father. In the name, uh, we pray in the name of Jesus to the Father. Excuse me, you get it right. I pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. So when I need something uh, from whom all blessings come or from all blessings flow, it's coming from the Father, a gracious Father, the Father God in heaven. So when I ask him according to the name of Jesus, if you ask anything in his name, in the name of Jesus, Father God, I need healing in my body. Father God, I need provisions to be made for my family. Father God, take care of this problem that's, uh, that I'm confronted with. Uh, Father God, keep my enemies away from me. Father God, protect me in the face of enemy opposition. Father God, help me in t the time of COVID. Lord, fulfill your word. Father God, uh, fulfill your word in the name of Jesus Christ, whom I serve, praise God. So everything needs to be asked in the name of Jesus. We ask the Father in the name of Jesus, and then we'll get those things that he has promised in his word. Praise the Lord. So he's the only way. You can't get to Father God through Mary. Despite what the priests have told you, you can't get through to Muhammad, regardless of that particular religion. Confucius say can't get you to Jesus, uh, can't get you to the Father. You got to come through. The only watchword that will work is in the name of Jesus. Praise God. No other great person has gone before. Uh, can, Aristotle can't get you there. Praise God. By high faith can't get you there. The only way you can get to, and the great apostles that went before us, some great pope that went and did some great things, none of them can get you to the Father except the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that angels look high and low, trying to find somebody that's worthy to loose the seals that were revealed in the book of Revelation. They saw throughout the whole world. They looked above the world, earth, on the earth, beneath the earth, they could find nobody that had met the qualifications to unloose the seal before Father God. The only one they found was the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It says, He is worthy, praise the Lord, to unloose the seal for mankind. Praise the Lord. Nobody else is worthy. Jesus is the only way. I don't care how holy you are, how much Holy Ghost you have, praise how many people you've converted. All the mighty deeds you've done, you'll never attain to where Jesus is, praise God. He is the only one that met the criteria the Father God established to be able to open the seals. He's the only one that can be the Lamb of God, praise God. Uh, the Lamb of Father God, Jesus Christ is the only one. Nobody else has uh, met the qualifications. So just, that's just that statement that I just told you there. The only way to the Father, praise God, is through the Lord Jesus. You can't get there no other way. I don't care how many beads you have in your hand that you count and you meditate upon, that's not going to get you there. If you don't say in the name of Jesus Christ, Father God help me, you'll never receive anything from the hand of Father God in heaven. Praise the Lord. I, told you, I hope you got that. The word way in that particular verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Uh, that particular word in the text is from the Greek word hudos. And hudos, or hados, means road. And by implication, it means route. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the only bridge God has provided to traverse the terrible divide. Uh, you have to come through Jesus Christ in order to have communion and restored fellowship with Father God. The Lord uh, Jesus is a, in the following parable describes how a person may access the sheepfold, the place of safety, provision, and shelter provided by the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. He's the one that's going to get you back to where to the Father is. Praise God. He's the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the earth. He is a shepherd also. Praise God. He's a lamb and he's also a shepherd. So he has multiple roles that he plays for us. And so 
Um, here in uh, John, the 10th chapter, in the first verse, it's very important for you to understand this, that uh, most assuredly I say to you, the Lord Jesus speaking, I'm reading from the New King James Version, uh, he who does not enter, listen to this, the sheepfold, by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. In this parable, the Lord describes anyone who tries to enter the sheepfold by any other way other than the door as a thief and a robber. This term is referring to false teachers, not just to the devil, but the false teachers here, masquerading as pastors who teach uh, that Jesus is not the only way. If they're doing that, then they're one of these devils here that's trying to that should have went up before somebody else to keep you from getting into the, the sheepfold. Uh, that Jesus is not the way to reach God. That there are multiple paths. He's teaching that. Don't listen to him. The false prophet. Praise the Lord. False teacher. Uh, which lead to enlightenment. So the way to enlightenment, and you hear those talking about enlightenment, but it's not the way that they're teaching is not through Jesus. False teachers are the worst kind of thieves. Think about that for a minute. Anybody who's a false teacher is the worst kind of thief that there is because they hide behind presbyters' garbs, uh, behind uh, um, backwards collars, backwards collars that indicate they're part of the clergy. That doesn't mean anything wrong with wearing those garbs, but make sure that you're teaching the right thing, that you really are an ambassador of Christ, and that you're not a, a, a crook, praise God. Um, that, that you're not a wolf in uh, a sheep in wolf's clothing, that you have no business wearing that attire because of really what's down in your heart. Fanciful titles, stained glass windows, nothing wrong with those things if the person inside there is really a child of God. You can have stained glass windows. A lot of churches have stained glass windows. And in a number of those churches, the leader of that church, the teacher, uh, is teaching the full gospel. It's teaching what the word has said. And if you're doing that, then they're acceptable. And you can have stained glass windows. Praise the Lord. Uh, lofty ideals and man-made creeds that vaguely resemble the Bible. There's a whole host of those. Today is Sunday, and they don't even have a cross on their building. They got a circle or something else, uh, and some other cosmic sign that indicate that they they don't they don't believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus that He shed on Calvary's cross. You can get to God any other way. In fact, a lot of ways, way, some of them are teaching that you're the God, you're the center of the universe. That is a lie from the pit of hell. But a lot of places are teaching it. And they seem to be doing quite well in terms of the amount, amount of money coming in. Just because a church has money, and just because they're rich and fit, and they can they have long arms that can reach anywhere, they're helping all these people doing that. If they're not confirming to what the Word says, not living by that Word, they are an alternative path to get you from going, uh, reaching the Father through the Son. Any path that's going to take you away from getting, having to go through the Son to reach the Lord Jesus, to reach the Father God, then that's a deception of the enemy. He makes it look good so you can go to heaven enjoying yourself. Praise the Lord. Let's get back to the script at hand. They often strip away the significance of the cross and the atoning work done by Jesus Christ, uh, replacing them with their own icon, uh, which is usually a symbol of a man as a center of the universe. Anytime you start talking about that, man's the center of the universe, apart from God, don't listen to him. And even if they come about center, man is center. Not, man, not the center. The Lord is the center. He should be the center of your universe, which will get you to follow the God. And if they bypass the Lord Jesus, don't listen to him. Throw him away. This esoteric religion, these esoteric religions um, teach their followers to be self-centered rather than God-centered. Some are talking about chakras. You can get to chakra one, two, and three. Yeah, I studied some of the Middle Eastern uh, type religions. You know, and you, you get to a certain level, chakra seven, you've arrived, and you know, you're well accomplished, you're, you're fulfilled, and all that. Well, that's an Eastern religion. That's not a religion that has to do with the Judeo Christian religion, uh, that, that base which says that Jesus is the only way to get to the Father. And if you go way back to the very beginning, praise the Lord. Uh, there was one God, not two, not multiple gods, praise God. And even there, the sinner was not man, the sinner was Father God. The sinner was the Lord. And uh, we needed to do what he says, not what we say. So our lives were supposed to be governed by God, even from the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the Lord gave the edicts, 
and the rules. And he said, the day you eat of this tree, you shall truly, you shall surely die. That's what he told Adam in the Garden of Eden. And he says, uh, in dying, literally in the Hebrew, it says, in dying you shall die. So they died that day when he and his wife partook of the forbidden tree and uh, partook his fruit and they ate it. Uh, that day he died spiritually. And then um, he, he lived to be 900 and some years old, uh, Adam. So when he got 900 and some years of age, the physical body died. So first the spirit man died, his connection with the Lord, and then subsequently his soulish realm and his spirit man. They both, uh, and his, uh, um, um, the, the, uh, his spirit man and his soulish man, they died on the day he partook of the fruit and they became blind to spiritual things. And then about 900 years later, his physical man died. And so the whole body, spirit, soul, and body was dead. And uh, that's where we are today, unless you receive Jesus as the Lord. That's why the Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sins. That's the state we're in until we confess Jesus as Lord. He becomes the life of our life. He, he becomes the light of our life to turn back on the dead spirit man so we have communion with Father God. Uh, we, uh, all men that have come uh, that have not embraced Jesus as Lord, they're living in darkness. And he said he came to bring light uh, to a dark world. And so the world was dark, praise God, except for those who look forward in faith, believing that Christ would bring the light and would bring illumination back to man. They, by faith, believed that that would take place, and they, by faith, served him for that reason. And so when he came... Praise God. That light that was in them began to illuminate. People began to realize that those people were really connected to the Lord. And similarly today, we look back. Christ has died physically, praise God, and has arose from the dead and is seated uh, at the right hand of the Father God in heaven, where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So I look back to what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, and by faith I appropriate the fact that he came, the 33 years that he lived here, on the earth, praise God, for, to fulfill eternal redemption for me. Then he died on Calvary's cross. He rose again. And now he's seated at the right hand of Father God in the heavens, where he intercedes for me to assist me in, in life's affairs. So I believe in him. I look back to when he rose from the dead and established eternal redemption for all of us who would appropriate him. I appropriated him, and I have eternal redemption. I am called a believer, a son of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ seated together with him positionally in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers. And the devil is beneath my feet. In the name of Jesus, I declare. Amen. Let's continue here. Praise the Lord. The following uh, verse states that Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, we were talking about uh, John the 10th chapter, uh, entered the sheepfold by the door. He provided. John the 10th chapter and the second verse. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Uh, the following verses of the Lord Jesus clearly states that he is the door by which all must enter, including the under-shepherd, the pastor, the teachers, and the parishioners. The disciples of, uh, of the Lord Jesus must also enter the sheepfold. John, the 10th chapter, verse 7 through 10 reads as follows. Then Jesus said to them again, Assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. They saying it again, making it clear to us that Jesus is the way. He is the door to the sheepfold. Can't get in the sheepfold unless you come through him. Uh, a verse, All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So we have counterfeits that have come before Jesus. And he said that his, his genuine sheep did not hear those counterfeits. Night verse. I am the door. I, uh, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And will go in and out and find pastors. If you don't enter into the gate by Jesus Christ, you're not saved. Praise God. You're a counterfeit. You have no right in there. You didn't come through the right doors. Praise God. Ten verse. The thief. We was talking about these uh, people many times would say, this is only the devil. Well, it's the devil too. But in the context of what we're reading here in the 10th chapter of the book of St. John, he's talking about false teachers. Praise the Lord. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And those are the attributes of Satan too. They're emulating uh, their father, the devil. Those people who cause others uh, to not come in through the proper door, through the, the door of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have come that they may... Jesus speaking, have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to give us the abundant life. 
uh, the life that we crave. People have spent all this effort and money trying to find it and, if, and time that they've expended uh, laboring to attain to certain lofty ideals that they seem to not be able to reach. But Jesus is saying that I'm the solution. If you come through me, you get everything you need, praise God, in life. According to the verse, false teachers characterized as the thief, prime motivation is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The word kill is from a Greek word, uh, thuo, and what it literally means is to sacrifice. I thought that was fascinating, that uh, the thieves come to sacrifice us, praise the Lord, or slaughter us uh, for any purpose. False teachers that expose false traditions or false religions will often sacrifice you. So they sacrifice you, knowing that the path they offer leads to distinction, uh, excuse me, destruction. For a few temporal benefits, and they'll tell you you're going to be distinguished, whatever, you, oh yeah, for a short period of time until you die, praise God, or until your business is pulled out from under you, which seems to be the case today. Um, for a few temporal benefits to their organizations, such as the deed to your house. So some of these false teachers will ask for the deed to your house in order to be in good standing with the church. Or a portion of your inheritance in order for you to be a member in good standing uh, with their organization. That, that's one thing that I'll watch. And all preachers should do that. The Lord, if, you, if you're in the business of being a, a pastor, if you've been called uh, into the clergy, and you are a pastor of a church, you should have enough faith to believe God will sustain you. And so you try and quick, uh, get quick fix uh, methods and, and um, cavorting with mankind with all kinds of wicked ideals to get people's money, to get them to give, not based on the scriptures, but based upon what somebody has concocted and put together. You're of the devil. You're a false teacher. Praise the Lord. And uh, if your church goes down, you, it deserves to go down because you're not teaching the full thing. They need to go somewhere else. They're not teaching what the Bible has said. They're teaching your ideals, which you have twisted the word of God, some to extreme, some minimally. But the point is, if you're in that minimal position, you have probably some hope for you. Repent and start doing things right. God will forgive you. Ask the church to forgive you. When they see you doing right, then everybody will be happy. Praise God. And just start teaching the word the way that it is written. Praise the Lord. Uh, in contrast, the Lord Jesus did not come to exploit you. I didn't, I, the Lord didn't come that way, and you watched it, preachers, to make sure they're not exploiting you. Really easy to see the games that are played by men. Uh, if you're only a mature person, I think every one of you can tell if a game is being played. And uh, I also say this, by the way, most times you make more money and fool around with the God's people. I mean, you just follow the path, you know, get your education get in a big corporation or start your own business, you can make a lot of money doing that. Jesus doesn't have to be any part of that. Now, you'll pay for it later on because you ignore the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to ignore you. And uh, you may have a good life until it's taken away or you die prematurely or may live a long time. But when you stand before the Lord, the beam of seat, you'll be sad because you didn't spend your time in the things of God and never sowed to your uh, spirit. You sowed to your flesh. You, and and uh, what you do on the Sundays... You didn't go to church, you went to the beach. Well, you can't go to the beach now because we have COVID. Uh, or you went to the mountains. You can't even get up to the mountains because they're going to restrict you at the bottom. Uh, praise God. The uh, ranger is going to stop you. Praise God. Because those places are closed up right now. They, we, you know, we're in a plague. And just in case you don't know, maybe your little money kept you alive long enough where you can avoid the plague. But it's in the air. And so there's restrictions with everything. So your money is no good right now. You can't even fly. When you get ready to fly, you got to go through all these rules to make sure you don't have the COVID to get anywhere. You can have the money today. You can't even go to a restaurant, praise God, and uh, in the normal setting that we had in the past. So there's a lot of restrictions here. But even with that, people that attack like, that, you know, life is like it was before. No, it's not. And a whole bunch of people have died. Millions of people have died from this disease that would not have died if it had been taken care of, eradicated. And so you're still trying to act like you don't see what's going on. We're under a plague right now. Uh, you can do all them lofty things you want to say, but, you know, we've been shut down since March here in the United States of America. Our church has been closed down and any other church to follow the rules. We shut down. We can't meet because of COVID, because the plague has been released on the land. And people are not praying and seeking God where they should. And I believe it's part of it. Uh, a curse has come upon the entire world because we've ignored the Lord. We've done things our way, 
and modified the, the gospel and doing and tampering with the things of God, not supporting it the way that you should, not making yourself living like a believer should live. You, you're not his workmanship creating Christ Jesus under good works. You've been unto bad works. And even our leadership, you can look at the leadership even of this country is supposed to be a good leadership. All the wicked things they're doing and all the millions of people that are on their way to hell because they're uh, conforming to something they know is of the devil. It's not love. When you do the kind of things that some of our leaders are doing, they're not living the love life. In the uh, First Corinthians, praise God, the um, 13th chapter where it talks about the love life, there's nothing that they're doing really hardly that uh, lines up any of those attributes and qualities that should be in a person who calls himself a believer. And what's really concerning me is those who are supposed to be full gospel people, those who are supposed to be tongue-talking people, they're not, if they're speaking in tongues, it's not unctioned by the Holy Spirit. It's unctioned by themselves. Their mind is doing that. A lot of them are not living for the Lord anymore. I hate to say that. The Bible says in the last days, you know, uh, that uh, wickedness is going to overwhelm the people, you know. And many are going to backslide and stop doing the things of God. Uh, the, the Bible says the love of many shall wax cold. So that's what we see, that love is waxing cold. The hatred has taken over in their lives. And the kind of things they're advocating, even so-called preachers, those are bishops, praise God, in some of the mainstream denominations, you know, um, uh, are not doing what they're supposed to do. And uh, I look at the face and the contortions that they go through when they're talking about some political issues and things of that nature, instead of well, always look at the source. It, it, the base of what this person is advocating is it predicated on the Word of God as some man-made ideal. See, the, the cosmos has a lot of ideas that sounds like they're uh, beneficial to man. But then most of the time it's contrary to what God has told us. And so if you're advocating somebody and you've forgotten about the Word of God, you need to repent and get back on the right turf. Get back on the lower turf, back on the lower side. Praise the Lord. And leave that other stuff for the worldly people. Praise God. And I know we indulge to some degree because we live here in the world. But there are limitations on how far we should go. Everything we do needs to be limited and controlled by what the Word of God says. So if we're stepping out of love, stepping into something else, that's of the devil. That's a thief. That he's deceived you. He's a deceiver uh, that's caused a whole bunch of people to fall. And unfortunately, some have fallen and have not been able to come back to their first love. And that's the bad part, that you live for God all these years, and then you got caught up in something that you shouldn't be involved in and advocating it and never got a chance to get back and ask the Lord to forgive you and to cleanse you from that sin and all unrighteousness. So you live like a representative of Christ Jesus, one who walks in love and walks in fellowship with God's Word. I think that's enough. I'll just move on here. Um, in contrast, the Lord Jesus did not come to exploit us uh, or to destroy us. To destroy life. Hell, a lot of people just destroying life. Don't even care. Don't even care how many people die. I care about how many people die. And I always think about their souls, not just their life. I also think about their livelihood and their families and things of that nature. But there's plenty of other people thinking about that. I'm worried about their soul. And when they died, uh, where, where are they going? Where are they going? They're going to heaven or they're going to hell? That's because I'm a leader. I'm a pastor. Uh, I'm an ambassador. My charter is to stop people from going to hell. To pull them out the flames if I can. And that's what I'm doing right now. You may not like the way I'm doing my, in my delivery, but somebody's got to do it. And I'm one of those who's going to tell you, whether you like it or not, good, bad, or ugly, praise God, I'm going to tell you the truth. And so when you stand before God at the white, white throne judgment, if you haven't done what I say, my words will come back and judge you, praise the Lord. Let's move on. I hope they come back and uh, bless you because you take what I'm saying and follow through with it, praise the Lord. He has made to you uh, a life that is a life that is uh, fully abundant. Um, be, before we transition at this particular point into a discussion about the assignment that the Lord has also uh, given believers, I uh, recall that he said that we are to do the works that he did and greater works uh, is what the Lord told us. And that's in uh, St. John 14 and 2. It says, most assuredly, I say to you, the Lord Jesus is speaking here. He who believes in me, the works that I do, uh, all he will do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to the Father. He's saying that, look, I have some ambassadors here, and they're going to do the same works that I did. Uh, when I was there, and greater works uh, uh, than what I did while I was in the earth realm. Uh, the reason for this assignment 
uh, to we who are ambassadors uh, to do uh, the works he did, the Lord, excuse me, the Lord Jesus did during his earthly sojourn, and even greater works is because he has ascended on high and is seated at the right hand of Father God. Fortunately, the Lord Jesus did not leave us to stumble around ignorantly, uh, but gave us instruction in the responsibility of those that are his preachers saying the following. Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 18 to 19. So here we're going to find out what our assignment is. If you're ministering and don't know what your assignment is, you haven't read the word. Now I'm going to tell you what your assignment is. Then you go back and validate it by reading what I'm reading right now. Luke, the 18th chapter, verse 19. The Spirit of the Lord Jesus speaking here. He's in the synagogue and he's telling them what his, his charter is. And by implication, what our charter is. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The first thing, do you have the Spirit of the Lord on you? you have some other spirit on you? Uh, and you know if you're a, per, a speaker or a teacher or a, a preacher or a minister, you know what kind of spirit's on you. Get the right one on you. Praise the Lord. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Praise the Lord. If you haven't been anointed to preach the gospel, get another occupation. Get out the way. Praise God. So somebody else can come fill your position who has been called, praise God, to preach the gospel to the poor. He's talking about a poor person here. Not just one who's poor in spirit. We're talking about they don't have any money. Praise God. Be down in the dumps. Praise God. Living in a ghetto. On the backside of the ghetto. Praise God. And the, so those people are struggling right now. Uh, they, uh, the money has been, subsistence has been cut off and they're struggling. And uh, some of them, hopefully if they got it, they can eat some beans and some, and uh, make some cakes to eat. And that, that'll keep them alive for a while. But they're struggling. Uh, they're not even drinking real milk. They're drinking um, powdered milk. If they can even get the powdered milk, uh, praise the Lord. So they're poor. Uh, he has sent me to heal the broken heart. So the Lord has been sent to the poor. And so the Lord sends us to the poor too. And I'll show you how in just a little bit. To preach deliverance to the captives. So in each case, notice here, he has anointed me to preach good news, that word gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So he's supposed to do healing, preach to the poor. They need to make a declaration to help change their ways. And so uh, that's what I do. I, I focus on that and showing people how they can get out of the, the doldrums that the enemy has put them in. Notice here. Uh, heal the brokenhearted. And we give scriptures and prayer. Praise God. Lay hands. The gifts of the Spirit operate. And it helps brokenhearted if they'll take the, the, the prescription, the medicine, rather than using some alternative ways. There's also many alternative ways that people think, oh, that's going to work, that's going to work, this medicine going to work. No, no, you better make sure you look at the spiritual approach to all of these things. To preach deliverance to the captive, those that are captive, you preach deliverance. How do you get out of this thing? Recovering of sight to the blind. Okay? And this blind here, is um, you can take it both ways. People who can't see and uh, pray supernaturally, have a, uh, the Holy Spirit comes by a gift of the Spirit and cause them to be able to see if they're blind. And if that's not the case, if it's blind to everything that uh, they're, being, they're encountering in life. They don't know how to uh, govern their steps. They don't know what path to take because they can't see. So it's spiritual here, and I can make their license. It's spiritual and it's also physical. It's all of it. It's everything. The Lord came to take care of all those things that are contrary to us. To set at liberty to them that are bruised. If you've been bruised, somebody beat you, somebody hurt you. Now again, we're a tripartite nature. Spirit, soul, and body. So all three of those can be bruised. Your mind can be bruised. Your, your soulish component of you that makes you a human being. Your spirit man that which allows you to have contact with the spiritual realm, especially Father God, can be bruised by somebody uh, teaching you garbage and things of that nature not measuring up to what the Word of God says, and you have confidence and faith in them, and that can leave a bruise on you that makes it difficult for anybody else to reach you. Uh, uh, physically, somebody beat you with whips, or somebody threw you in jail, left you in there, gave you a sentence that's ten times more than what it's supposed to be. So, I mean, I mean, it's all these bad things that can bring you to a point where you're bruised. You're bruised in your physical body, you're bruised in your mind, and you're bruised in your spirit man by those things you've encountered in life. And that's why you need to come to the Lord Jesus. And that's what he's saying here. He's come to take care of, uh, to help those who are bruised. And that's my charter, to help those that are bruised, whether spirit, soul, or body. Whatever it is, uh, I'm the prescription, 
as the under shepherd uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. 19. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. If you're truly an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will preach all the counsel of God. Acts, the 20th chapter, 27 verse, the Apostle Paul says that. Can you teach a portion of it? Now, let me just talk about that. Uh, I believe in feeding the poor, helping them and all of that. But uh, that's not the whole gospel there. I mean, that's the middle of the gospel. They can have their stomachs full, plenty of food to eat that you're providing, or your church is providing. But what did you say about Jesus? You didn't say anything about Jesus to a point where they can look at their lives and, and begin to um, make a change toward the Lord Jesus Christ. You're wasting time. You're not doing what God has called you to do. That person will have a full stomach. They'll be nice and happy. They'll have clothes to wear and everything and go to hell. Did you know I just told you? And a little money in their pocket, $50 here and $25 there. Yeah, they'll take that money, go buy some food to eat. Or may get something to drink. Praise God. It may not all be good soothing food. It might even be alcoholic. But then you're empowering them to stay in the life they're in. Somebody got to tell them that a change is required in order for them to embrace the things of God. And that's my charter as a preacher of the gospel. To lead them and direct them towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Some get angry with me. But I understand how people are. Well, there's some poor say Those poor people living under the bridge. Oh, they're poor. But then if they listen to any words that have been declared, how did they get there? And are they willing to come out by following the standards? Now, we don't have any more. We used to have a, a group here. Uh, I guess they do still have it. We used to have a place we could send people for about six months, uh, the whole family. And uh, they get fed. They have to come in at a certain time. They can stay out all night. See, and the people today don't even want a mask because they tell them, oh, you're breaking my rights. And then people dying left and right with COVID. And some of those people are calling themselves Christians. It's just idiotic. And uh, I just look and watch this. They don't do social distancing. They don't do nothing. They're tempting God. And then they went, why will God protect me? Because you tempted him. It'd be the same thing. Uh, if you got uh, some, some incurable disease, let's say leprosy. And you know all the people that are on that street have leprosy. And you go and walk up and down that street and uh, don't protect yourself. Or you even shouldn't even be there. You have no business going over there. So if you go over there and you get leprosy, then you're tempted God, even though you call yourself a believer. You know, he didn't tell you to go over there. He, he you know, we should suppose he's wise as a servant and harmless as dove. And so for those of you that's doing that, talking about God's going to protect you, as he protect you from a call and everything else, you may have to go through it. You may live, but he's going to spank you behind with it. So we need to stay away from places that's going to make us sick. And we know it's going to make us sick. And we tell them, I'm pleading the blood on this world. Did you plead the blood for every other ailment you had in your body? Did it work 100% every time? Well, the Lord makes his decision about the gifts of healing operated. And, there, and that's what you need to read. Read the fine print. In uh, Acts, the, uh, I know I'm getting hard on you. Acts, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, down at the 12th chapter there, he talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And it says, every single one of them operate as the Spirit wills. Now, my point is, for what you're doing, does the Spirit will that the gift of healing is going to work on you? And you're being disobedient and rebellious, not doing the things that you're supposed to do as a human being? If you're willing and obedient, I don't know if I'm going to get there today. Isaiah said, if you're willing and you're obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. And uh, the corollary to that is terrible. Praise God. I'm going to wait till the point in time to read that. So if you're not willing to do the right things and you're not obedient, to the things we're supposed to obey the laws of the land, long as they're not contradictory to the word of God, and you're not doing that right, you're not going to eat the good of the land. You're going to have some problems. And some of you and some of your loved ones are going to die of COVID because you didn't do what you're supposed to do. That's enough on that. Nobody's talking about that. Well, my rights, my rights. Well, you know, they tell you, you get on the freeway, the speed limit is 65. And you want to go 85, they're going to write you a ticket. So there's going to be consequences for doing things that don't make sense. And so you're okay with that. We got lift speed limits, but then you're talking about, I can't wear a mask because that's my, my rights and my privilege. I'm supposed to have rights. And, well, it's, everywhere we go, they got things. That you, no parking here. They got red. And every, that's we're in a civilized society. In a civilized society, they have rules and regulations to govern the society so we all can live a peaceable life. I'm glad they got red marks on the sidewalk for parking. Because then I couldn't get in my driveway. I had a problem even now because COVID's there. People parking away have no business. They blocked the churches parking lot, a parking uh, entrance, a big old uh, camper truck 
about four or five feet into where we're supposed to be able to get into the, the door. So if you don't have rules in place, people, many of whom are not saved, will take advantage of you. And you have no one to go to because there's no laws. We need laws and we need rules to govern society. And that's what Paul is talking about, praise God. In the book of Romans, read the last chapters in the book of Romans, he'll tell you that those things are okay. We are so super spiritual, we don't read our own Bibles to see we need rules and regulations in an orderly society or none of us will have any peace. We need policemen so they don't break in your house, kick in your window, kick in your door so you can drive the street without having somebody bothering you. Praise the Lord. We need rules and regulations for society. And so we abide by those godly rules. Those are godly rules that God has allowed men and women to put in place so we can have a peaceable life. So nobody catch you and put, and put you on the street and put their knee on your neck. We're supposed to have some laws to take care of it. But when you're protected by the government, it's supposed to protect you, not kill you. Now, sometimes they do. That don't mean you're supposed to back off. They'll shirk off. Oh, we don't have no more laws. We'll get rid of all law enforcement. And people will be breaking in your house left and right, and you'll have no protection. Praise the Lord. And then you can't shoot them because you didn't take them before the court. And the courts are not operational because they don't have the money to be operational now. It's all kinds of rules. Use your mind. We got a man here, praise God. Yeah, I'm filled with the spirit, but I have a physical body and I have a mind in my head that lets me know how to govern myself, praise God. Uh, even though I also have the Holy Spirit that takes me to the next level. I mean, somebody needed to hear that. Praise the Lord. A whole bunch of Christians from what I'm seeing in the South, praise God, they need to hear that. Somebody got to shake us and bring us back to where we need to be as loving, kind believers, praise God. People who are sane, that adhere to what the Word of God says. People who know that the law and order is good if it's a good law. And even in the book of, throughout the, the book of the um, Proverbs, it talks about good kings and bad kings. It makes it clear, you can do a contrast there even when I go into the New Testament about how kings are supposed to act and how people respond to those who are good kings and how they respond to bad kings. And you can see that uh, played out here in the United States of America. So anyway, let's get back to the scripture. Make sure you're living by the scripture here. The gospel. So the first thing that we need to do as a believer, if you call yourself a believer, uh, uh, an ambassador of Christ Jesus, uh, 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 disciples that have been developing the things of God, uh, we're supposed to preach the gospel to the poor. Poverty is a part of the curse of the law. I, I, and I'm going to break some of the sacred cows here. Uh, described in Deuteronomy 28 chapter. Due to the disobedience to God, to law. The prophet Isaiah encouraged us to submit, this is what I was talking about, to the Lord's directives and declare the consequences of disobedience, sin, the following. God was wanted to reiterate, I didn't know it was coming up. Isaiah, the first chapter, 19 verse, New King James Version. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. This, by, this says right here, that if you've been willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. So if you're impoverished, can't eat, whatever, somebody have not been doing what they're supposed to do. They have not been willing, they have not been obedient. Let me just give you a case in point. Uh, there was a guy who was panhandling. I used to do this all the time. I stopped and give him some money. Now, uh, and obedient. And then I said to him, there's a place, this just a few years ago, there's a place you can go to, bro, where you don't have to be on the street. It's a youngster. Uh, uh, no, he's an older man, I guess he was. I said, you don't have to be out here, brother. And nights get cold, and the, this is no place for a human being to be. So I, my advice to you uh, is to go to this place. I gave him the number and everything. And the, the guy turned around and got mad. I think he cussed me out. I'm trying to reach to him the number he can go to where he can get, you get at least six months. Back, they don't do that now. Six months to clean your life up and, and to get a job. They even make contact with the corporate America where they will hire you and train you. And you can get off the street. They give you a salary. And they will keep you there if you just follow the rules. He didn't want to follow the rules. He will stay out all night. He don't want to go in at the appointed time, 10 o'clock, I think it was the curfew, that you have to be at the place every day, 10 o'clock. You have to go in the morning uh, and listen to them preach a message about, that's what they're supposed to do, teach a message about the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to do that, then you don't get to eat. Praise the Lord. But it was a requirement at some place where if you don't come, they kick you out because there's plenty of people waiting to get in there. And so they will take care of you, develop you, give you something, put something in your head that you never learned, uh, obedient. The reason why you're there, a lot of people, because they haven't been obedient to 
uh, the gospel and to the, the, the society to cause themselves to get out of harm's way. Are you, are you listening to me? And most people don't want you to say that. You know, I just happen to be here. You, you know, don't, don't, don't scold me because I'm, I'm out here living in a tent and I've been out here for 15, 20 years. There's something you're doing that's not right. And you're not willing and obedient so that someone can come and give you some ideas on where you can go to get off the street. Now, my charter, what I did for a number of years, some of it's hard to do now, is for people that I knew was going to end up in jail or going to end up without any money, uh, impoverished, praise the Lord. I, uh, and they were youngsters, most of them were young men in their early 20s. And um, I would tell some were in their late teens. And I would tell them, you know, it's sort of messed up high school, you can't go to college, they won't accept you there, you don't have any money. Your mama dead, daddy dead, or whatever. You by yourself uh, right now. Aunt don't want you to come by anymore. None of your relatives. And so you're out there. I said, you want to get off the street? One of them, a number of them told me yes. Uh, and I had, uh, at that time, I don't have it right now. I had a curriculum they can go to in three months and get certified in the technical field, computers, where they could find a job, plenty of jobs. that would, They would hire them, give them benefits. Day one, if you pass the test they had, and I told them where to go to learn the materials. Then I had one who had been in penitentiary. He was sitting on my porch. And I said, I know you didn't try it your way. Do you want to try the Lord's way? Do you want to get off of this, get out of the, the cycle, you know, round and round, back to jail, back to the street, back to jail, back to the street? He said, yeah. I said, you got to do exactly what I told you. And I told him where to get his materials. I went online with him, showed him where it was. And I said, now I want you to study all these materials uh, diligently. And this is where you can go get hands-on uh, time for free. I told him where to go. He did it. And about, uh, I think it was three or four months later, he passed the test, praise God. And they certified him. At that time, I think it was Microsoft. He became a Microsoft engineer. He's been a Microsoft, follow me, listen to me, Microsoft engineer now. It's been 20 years, more than 20 years. Well, let's see here. Yeah, more than 20 years he's been a Microsoft engineer. From prison, praise God, to a Microsoft engineer. He takes care of himself, has his own house, his own car, and things. Now, he needs to come closer to the Lord. That's another issue we'll talk about. But there's a way out of this. He was willing and he was obedient, and he got a good job that has lasted 20-some years. He's making big money, praise God, because he listened. And some of y'all just need to listen. You get out of poverty, but you got to be willing and obedient, and you'll eat the good of the land. I'll read this last verse here, and we'll start here next week. Isaiah, uh, the first chapter, verse 20, continuing. But if you, if you're not willing and obedient, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Listen to me. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. For all these people talking about God, God would never allow this. No, so he sends a sword to you. You had opportunity. You weren't willing. You were not obedient. And now, because you've been exposed to the things of God, but you rejected him, he sends a sword. He said, God, take the sword and take care of him. Praise God. I know it's different from what some people are telling you. I stick with the word. But if you stick with the word, your life will be a wonderful place. God bless you, my friends. Join me next week. We'll continue in the same vein. Go with God. Amen. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822 or you may request information via our website at www.sjwomcc.org We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.